Hey hey, Marcus House with you here. Today we are going to be doing a few rescue missions. I've been just observing the mission control there so that we can uh, pick up a few rescue missions just because running quite low on Kerbals and we really could use a few more. They get quite expensive. Uh, so yes, we're going to use a new vessel here. Uh, something a little fun, a little bit different for my channel. We're going to do an SSTO. The only difference, of course, being that this SSTO is a space plane, which is, uh, yes, yeah, something much more suited probably to Mark Thrym or Matt Lown. But I'm going to give it a damn good crack anyway. So as cargo in all three of these massive cargo bays, we have these submarine type looking <laughs> vessels. These are just remotely controlled probes, basically, and we can use these to pick up our Kerbals. This massive beast has got 32 rapier engines and it has a whole bunch of shock cone intakes to fuel these when they're in air breathing mode. This beast only is supposed to get to orbit and back so we don't have nerve rocket motors. It's a very easy SSTO to fly. So just launching this thing now, obviously we will be starting here with air breathing mode. We have some action groups set up to quickly switch between air breathing mode and closed cycle mode. For those of you that haven't flown with the rapier engines, they obviously have the two modes. They will automatically switch into closed cycle mode as soon as they run out of intake air. Now I have that switched off and I'm manually choosing to do that with the number three key if you're downloading this vessel. Uh, that basically switches the mode of the rapier engines. So as I said, this is a massive, massive space plane. It weighs in at over 590 tonne. Uh, that's with the cargo that we've got loaded in here. Now, even with our 32 rapier engines, the thruster weight on this thing at liftoff is actually still quite low and we need to climb quite high and get up quite a bit of speed until our rapier engines become more and more efficient. But of course, as we get higher, we lose our intake air. So we do need to switch to closed cycle mode here about now. And we just need to punch ourselves up just until we get to that 70 kilometer mark at our apoapsis. After circularizing, we can simply now empty our three cargo bays. We're going to empty them out from the rear. We have an action group set up to undock all three vessels if you need it. And we can simply just thrust forward to have all of the uh, all of the vessels come out at the same time. How cool is that? So we can now pop the three solar panels out on each of our space submarines. And uh, yes, we can say goodbye to our crew of the space plane. Uh, and we will return back to this crew in just a few moments. Now we'll just start breaking away one of our space submarines here to head out to pick up our first uh, rescue. Now, of course, you don't need to send all three of these vessels out. You could actually just send out one of these at a time like this. I really only bought all three out at once because it looked kind of cool. So anyway, we are taking our first vessel here to set up our intercept. Now, Loster Kerman is our first rescue here. Now, Loster apparently was a backyard space rocket enthusiast who decided that it would be a great idea to uh, send himself up on one of his test vessels. Of course, uh, he didn't have any of the heat shielding parts to bring himself back. And of course, he didn't realize that the back end of his craft would completely burn up in the atmosphere as he was in the final stages of his launch ascent profile. Of course, the Kerbal Space Center took a call from Loster's mother, requesting some assistance to try to rescue her idiot son. So yes, we have been tasked with rescuing Loster here from his cupola module. Although Loster is quite happy to be rescued and is making his way via EVA over to our rescue craft, he is a little apprehensive about getting back home to his mother. He is expecting the spanking of a lifetime. Now we have our next rescue target locked in and ready to go. We are basically here time warping until our intercept gets close enough to actually burn retrograde and match the intercept perfectly. You can see here with each orbit we make, our orange intercept markers there get closer and closer together. As soon as they get about as close as they're likely to in the one orbit, we can then make our final adjustment here to complete our intercept. 
Now luckily we did have enough fuel there to rescue our next stranded Kerbal. Uh, her name is Melreen, she has her own interesting story. The report as far as I've seen is that Melreen was flying with a competitor space agency. Apparently she had climbed into a lander can and one of the other careless Kerbals on board accidentally <laughs> jettisoned her uh, into orbit as they were re-entering the atmosphere. So Melreen, uh, a very unlucky story. She is not only happy about getting rescued, but she's also quite looking forward to getting back to Kerbin to punch Jack Kerman in the face for sitting on that release button. So we have both of our Kerbals rescued. The next step of course after retracting that solar panel is heading back into the atmosphere. We can actually land this thing. It has two parachutes there on the front. And as far as space submarines go, these things are designed very well to withstand the searing entry heat. Now we can oscillate the vessel up and down to actually wipe off our velocity faster like we've just done here. Uh, the vessels are very heavily weighted towards the rear near the nerve rocket motors. That, uh, that makes them very easy to re-enter. Both our parachutes are deployed, just waiting to touch down now. And there we go there. So we'll recover this vessel. And as soon as we get back to the space center, we can see that we've recovered 96% the value of this vessel. We've also picked up our wonderful two new Kerbals. After they have their various encounters, we will have them available in our astronaut complex. Back up now to our second space submarine. This one is heading to the moon to pick up our other two stranded Kerbals. Now both of these rescue vessels are actually rotating around the moon in the same way. We have up here Logie and Sheldon, so we're setting up our transfer here now. We have a fairly lengthy burn of over 850 meters per second to get up to the moon. This thing is powered only by one single nerve rocket motor, so its thruster weight is still quite low. And as we fall away from Kerbin and fall towards the moon, we will pass right over the orbit lines there of our two rescue vessels. Luckily, they're both at the exact same altitude as well. So we'll just do here a retrograde burn until we can get those orange markers to line right up for our intercept. Now, we have been contracted by the military to rescue Logie Kerman here. Uh, we've been given absolutely no information as to how he got stranded here. We can only assume that there has been some accident with a military spacecraft. Now one way to make your intercepts easier is to try to align your target retrograde marker with your anti-target marker and keep them together and that will basically mean as you come in, you will basically be right on top of the thing like that. That is awesome. You do have to be a little careful not to just smack into it though. <laughs> so out comes Logie here. He is going to come up and board our vessel. And in he goes there. He's going to remain quite tight-lipped about why he's even here in the first place. On to our next rescue. Our final Kerbal to rescue here is Sheldon. Now Sheldon is a celebrity on Kerbin who decided it would be a great thing to actually take a flight around the moon with a private space agency. Of course, the private space agency's rocket failed uh, as it was actually completing its flyby, leaving poor Sheldon in a highly eccentric orbit around the moon. Now, luckily, he did have a final stage of RCS which he could deploy to actually circularize in a low moon orbit so that he wasn't going to fly off into space. Now Sheldon, of course, being the celebrity that he is, is quite unaccustomed to spending lengthy amounts of time stuck in a small capsule, so word has it that he's actually gone completely insane. Not insane enough to forget how to use his EVA pack, however, so he is now boarded. We can now head this thing back to Kerbin. We just need to now time warp around to the opposite side of the moon so that we can begin doing our ejection burn out to Kerbin. So just starting our burn there now, we need to burn around 300 meters per second to not only exit the moon sphere of influence, but also drop our Kerbin periapsis uh, right down to around 35 kilometers. Hopefully on the long journey back, our two passengers can get along quite nicely. Of course, they come from very different backgrounds. Before re-entry, of course, we'll bring in that solar panel. 
Now because we are coming in on the dark side of Kerbin and also the opposite side to the Kerbal Space Center, we're going to try something a little different. We're going to first re-enter the atmosphere, uh, come out the other side and then burn a lot of our remaining fuel here just to drop ourselves right back at the Kerbal Space Center. Well, hopefully that's the plan anyway. Just using our little waving technique all the way through the atmosphere here just so that we can reduce as much velocity as possible. So we will now begin our burn there using our single nerve rocket motor. Now, the main reason that I'm actually doing this is because we don't want to land using our parachutes with full tanks and we really had much more Delta V than what we actually needed to do those two rescues. In fact, we can actually land on the moon and actually come back from the moon entirely with this vessel quite easily. It could almost get to Duna and back. Even still, there was heaps more fuel left in this thing. So just touching down there and we can balance there and recover the vessel. Awesome. So again, we have recovered 98% the value of that vessel and we have also picked up our two new Kerbals. Now we of course still have one of our space submarines up in orbit around Kerbin. We are not going to use this today. We are going to leave this up here for a future rescue. In fact, it could almost be used just to go and pick up some of our crew that have been stuck on Minmus for, well, basically since the first few episodes of my entire channel. They're still up there. For now, though, we need to bring back our massive big space plane. Now, I haven't actually given this space plane a name of any sort. I know other channels love to name their SSTO space plane. So, yes, give us some suggestions. I'd be quite interested to know what you guys come up with. So just starting that retrograde burn to bring us down and line us up with the Kerbal Space Center. And then of course we will quickly flip around forward facing so that uh, yes, we actually hit the atmosphere facing the correct direction. Now like any space plane, the balance of the entire vessel is actually extremely important. Now in this re-entry situation, we have a little fuel loaded into the front fuel tanks of the vessel just to keep the nose down because obviously uh, with all of these uh, rapier engines, this vessel can get quite heavy towards the back. The air brakes that I've got popped onto the back of this thing will help reduce your velocity a little more. Uh, if you do find them overheating, obviously at certain parts of your descent, pop them back in. Um, they are very, very prone to overheating. Now in this situation, I probably could have come in just a little earlier because uh, yes, we're going to overshoot the runway here. We can of course simply turn ourselves around, pop our engines back onto air breathing mode and come back to descend down onto the runway. Landing gear down, and we can slowly but surely make our way down to the runway. Obviously this footage is all very heavily sped up so you don't have to watch all this in real time. And touchdown! Yes, now we can bring out those parachutes to bring us to a full stop. So Burberry, Bob and Patos Kerman have successfully completed their first maiden flight of this vessel. And of course, because we are recovering this thing from the runway, we get back 100% of the value of all the parts, minus of course the fuel. So there we go there, we have completed all of our contracts. And of course, we have tested out a great new single stage to orbit space plane that we can use for future missions. Now before we go today, just wanted to drop a few more flags. First of all, we are dropping a gigantic flag here. Uh, if I can actually get the thing to come down and behave itself and line up on the actual stage there like I want it to. Um, come on, come on. There we go, that's getting quite close there. So what we're going to do here is we are going to hack our quick save and replace the flag graphic with a new flag graphic. And of course, I am dropping a massive flag here for Matt Land. Now, those of you that have seen the Collaboration Station series, uh, you will probably understand just how much organization was involved in all that. So Matt Lown, uh I couldn't have done any of that without you. So thanks very much for all the assistance organizing that series. Also dropping a new flag here for another different Matt who found the uh, the hidden Easter egg in the thumbnail from last week. So nice work. 
Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. Please do take a second and give it a thumbs up. All of your support helps a massive, massive amount. If you have any questions for me, of course, do whack them down in the comments below. Thanks very much to all of you that have subscribed. And for those that haven't, please do subscribe to see more. Follow me on Twitter at Marcus House Game, and we'll see you in the next video. We can now undock that main core module and watch the extreme lifter slowly rocket away. Ever so gently, we don't want to destroy anything at this stage. We'll come back to our extreme lifter landing attempt in just a few moments.